it's a competition clinching shot. Whoa. How about that? The LET Golf Podcast, the official podcast of the Ladies European Tour. Hello and welcome to another episode of the LET Golf Podcast. I'm George Cooper and what a fun week we just had in Florida for the second Aramco Team Series event of the season. In the team event, Pauline Rousson continued where she left off in Singapore by guiding her foursome of Nuria Aturios, Trish Johnson and amateur Michael Bickford to victory. In the individual, it was 7 heaven for Spain's Carlotta Siganda as she clinched her 7th LET victory by one shot over Clara Davidson Spilkova. If you missed the action, head over to the LET YouTube channel where you can really have the coverage along with the highlights, interviews and all that good stuff. Next up for our stars, the European swing continues as we head to Naxler Golf Club for the Belgian Ladies Open. As always, follow us on socials at LET Golf to see how the week unfolds. Right, let's get our guest on and this week we're joined by Aramco Team Series superstar Cassandra Alexander. At 23 years old, the South African already has three ATS team victories to her name coupled with four wins on the Sunshine Ladies Tour. Now chasing her first outright trophy on the LET this season, Nicola Kenton sat down with Cass to chat about her golfing heroes growing up, her impressive fitness regime, and her obsession with extreme sports and trainers. So without further ado, this is Cassandra Alexander on the LET Golf Podcast. Cass, how are you doing today? I'm very good, thanks, and yourself? Good, good. How have you found this break that we've had? over the last seven weeks? Very long, to say the least. Um, I think the beginning was really nice. You know, you could relax at home, take some time off, and then you get practicing, but it, it's hard to get into it when you have so many weeks off. So I decided to come early to Miami. Um, I always struggle to get a visa to come here just because of timings. It's, you need a certain amount of days at home. And obviously for once I had it now with seven weeks off. So just came to Miami to spend a few days here, see what the U.S. is all about. So the ending of the, the long week off, the long, long weeks off is great, but it did drag out through the middle. Yeah, but you had a great start to the weeks off as well, being in the winning team in Singapore. Uh, talk, talk me through that tournament when, again, we know you for doing these clutch putts and the, these team tournaments. Uh, talk me through that final day. It was actually quite a fun event. Um I always like going to ask the captains before the event, so who are you picking, so who are you picking, so who are you picking? And I was on the putting green in Singapore and I saw Christy Wolf there and I was with um, George Twineman, the caddy, and um, I said to Christine, because I had a feeling she was going to pick me, I don't know why, so I just said to her, so who are you picking this week? She's like, should I really tell you? And I was like, yeah, are you going to pick me? I have a feeling you're going to pick me. And uh, she said, yes, I actually do want to pick you are you okay with that? And I was like, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. And then George threw in a stupid comment, as George always does, and says, if you can't beat them, join them, because I beat Christine in the playoff <laughs> in the previous ATS event. So she said, no, no, I'm picking you, so let's have a good week. And we got Ellie, and that was a great third pick. Um, I mean, we had such a fun week, and we just really enjoyed it. I mean, I wasn't very useful most of the week, except for the last hole, but I tend to do that all the time. <laughs> it's my, my style of... ATS events. Um, so, yeah, it was just a great week. Happy I could make the putts, had fun of the ladies, and yeah, I seem to enjoy the team events. Hopefully, I can do better in individual this time around. For sure. I was going to say, what is it about those team events? Do you just like the fact that obviously, generally, you get along with everyone in your team and you just there's a good vibe going throughout those two days that you have? Yeah, and I've played also every single ATS event since it started. So, like, everyone's like, oh, wow, you've won three. But I've also played in a lot. So I haven't won every single one I've played in. But I just, every time we've won, I've had a really nice group. And I feel like the third player always makes a big difference. Because whoever picks you, well, the people that have picked me before, they know me. So we get along well already. And then it's that third person that kind of really decides the, the vibe for the week and I don't know. I feel like we don't push. We just have fun. We enjoy it. We um, entertain the amateur. The amateur respects that we're still playing an individual game. And it ends up working out really well for us. So, yeah, I think you've just got to have fun. Because I've played also in teams where we pushed to try win. And it just doesn't end up happening. And you start getting frustrated with yourself because you're not making putts for the team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think the key is really just to have fun and if it's your week and all three of you can contribute where you need to and dovetail really well, then you can do well. And that putt on 18, as you mentioned, were, were you nervous beforehand? 
I was nervous, but I was like, oh, here we go again. The same play out every single time. And I actually said to the ladies as I was walking up, I was like, I love to do this where I play terrible the whole week and contribute hardly anything to the team and then just steal the shine. Because Ellie had the best week. She was making so many birdies. She was chipping in from everywhere. She kept hitting the pin on day two. I think she hit the pin like three times. We thought she got a hole in one, like she was just on fire. And I felt terrible because Christine picked me and I was really like making a birdie here or there, nothing serious, not really contributing as much. And then, I don't know, the last hole I was like, okay, well, they have putts, so let me make sure I have a putt. But I went aggressive because I knew they had putts too, so I hit the last shot. So I went at it, so I was like, I'm aiming right of the pin because the pin was tucked back right, wind off the right. So I was like, I'm aiming right of the fin- pin, finishing on it, like getting it as close as possible to make it as easy as possible. I thought Elio was going to make her putt, and then when she didn't, the heart started racing. It's the most amazing feeling though because it's something you work for your whole life to get that feeling so I think it's harder to get into that situation than it is to actually make the putts if you've obviously prepared well and you've worked hard your whole life just to make those little putts so yeah it was fun absolutely and you mentioned that working hard your whole life so we'll start with how you got into golf I believe you kind of started properly with the sport at the age of 10. Yeah, 10, 11 there, around there. Yeah. It's not the prettiest story uh, how I got into it. I played a lot of sports growing up. Um, I actually wanted to be a professional hockey player, field hockey. Um, it's just really difficult to have a career path in that without having to study or have a job on the side, which is exactly what I didn't want. But I played a lot of sports. I enjoyed sports. If you give me a book, I'm super dumb. But I can do any ball sport. I played most of it growing up. I enjoyed it. I was really good at it. I always played for the teams higher than me. And then I never played golf, really. Um, I just played 100 other sports. And my mom was, um, her friend was playing golf. And he uh, said, why don't you try it out? I tried it out. I got a little club that had like that, that grip on that teaches you how to grip it. I went to the range. I sucked. And I was like, cool. Well, if you suck, then you got to go back and make sure you get it right. Because most other sports, I would just get right quickly. I I played netball. My mom said, try netball out. I went and played, and I made the team two days later, and I'd never played netball in my life. And from there, I went up and up. So golf kind of frustrated me because I didn't get it right straight away, which is golf for you. But me at the age of – I think I was uh, – I picked up my first club when I was about 10, and then I just used to go to the range in the afternoons and um, played my first tournament. I remember I went up to one of my friends – from the golf and I was like oh I played so well I shot 95 and she's like oh that's great I shot 92 and it's so funny because it's actually Kaylee Telfer she she's a South African girl that studied in the States she came and played S Open, Joburg Open and got an invite to Singapore and I actually thought about that memory when we were there because uh, we went for dinner the one night that was my first golf tournament I remember I went to her and I said I shot 95 and she's like wow amazing I shot 92 and then from there I was pretty hooked I knew it was one of those sports where you have to put your like a lot of work in and you can't just hit golf balls in the summer and in the winter uh, hibernate um so i got into it and i started practicing and then slowly other sports started falling behind golf um so i was always known as the golf girl so i missed hockey practices because i was at golf and it was fine because i was a good hockey player and then eventually as you get better and to the end of high school and that golf was always the priority and everyone else knew that so I wouldn't get as many starts on the hockey team, for example. Golf started and all my other sports got left behind. I still love other sports. Like, for me, it's fun. I just started mountain biking. So much fun. I still love playing other sports. Obviously, I try to stay away from the hockey because it's a bit dangerous. But it's just part of who I am. It's what I do on the weekends. It's what I do for fun. It's a hobby activity. So, yeah, I'm very lucky. Don't ask me to study anything because that's not going to go very well <laughs> it's all about the sports and so when when you were doing all those different sports when you were long, younger you clearly have very good hand-eye coordination as you said if you can pick up a sport very easily but was it also the social aspect of being around different people and making friends and sports as well definitely uh the social aspect is a big part of it I was fortunate enough to be allowed the opportunity to try different sports and see what I liked and what I didn't and it was a big social part of it, but also I'm super competitive. So I really made a lot of friends that were competitive too because I would dribble them in hockey and score a goal and then they out to get me. And at the end of the day, we become friends and we're practicing together to get better and help each other and that. But yeah, funny, my best friend's actually the biggest nerd in the world. She was like the smartest person in school. So we actually made a deal when I was in school. I said, I'll teach you hockey. you got to help me pass school somehow. So I used to bribe her with food and 
everything just to help me pass school. If, if I didn't have her, I don't know if I would have passed high school. So I started teaching her hockey and she started helping me. Uh, I didn't listen, so I eventually just started copying her and sat next to her. But she played hockey and we went to this hockey practice. I think it was her like fifth practice. Now she was into it and I've taught her all these things. And I remember the goalkeeper kicked the ball and it hit her straight in the pip. And she had this huge like thing on her head and she said, I'm not going back to hockey ever again. I remember going up to her and I was like, but you're still going to help me at schoolwork, right? <laughs> so that was my relationship with her. But that's how... I made friends that uh, most of my friends are in sports, not specifically golf, actually, like a lot of other sports as well. Golf is one of those sports that really takes over your life. So if you don't, not distance yourself, but have a life outside of golf, it becomes very difficult when you're not playing well because mm -hmm. it consumes everything. Yeah, that's how I made friends. That's how I kept friends. And I still have, I want to go play a lot of sports that I can't and try new things that I haven't, but you've got to be careful with, the sport we in it's it's not one of those where if you have a broken finger you can just carry on playing or a broken toe it's, you use every muscle in your body so it's a bit boring that way my plan is to retire like Suzanne Peterson and go skiing and do crazy things all the time and have fun so I'll wait for my time to do all those things <laughs> you're waiting for the adrenaline rush to finish exactly. your career. <laughs> when you break your arm you're like ah oh, damn that's that's one of those things yeah and so then how important has sport been to your life yeah, definitely. I think sports played a huge role in my life. I think it's taught me a lot of lessons that other things couldn't. Or maybe some people learn lessons the other way. I learned everything through sport. I met all my people through sport. I enjoyed being by myself on a sports field. For example, hockey, hitting balls or going to the range, hitting balls there. It was just, it was everything. And it taught me everything I know. How to deal with people, how to professionally deal with people, how to do business deals, how to... Um, work with other people, how to work with stubborn people, how to work with people who suck at hockey and you have to be nice to them because they're on your team. Like It's just like a lot of things that I think made me very mature from a very young age. I also grew up single mom, so when she was at work, I was doing my own thing. She came home at five o'clock in the afternoon and I didn't know any different because that's how I grew up. So it made me very mature. I mean, I always get that I'm like 28 and I'm 23. There's it's, I'm not, but like I say, I got married young, I, I moved out of the house young, I bought a house young, I carried on traveling by myself when I was young, so it's kind of just normal to me, so I'm 23, but I feel like a 30-year-old, and I feel like I'm in a 30-year-old space, I mean, there's no timeline exactly for how life should go, but there's a general pattern that's followed, and I feel like that's where I'm at, but I'm still got some years, so it gives me more time on tour before all the serious things start happening and all that, so yeah. I was going to say, and because you've only been on tour kind of for the past three, three and a half years since 2020. So you're still really young in your career on tour. We'll, we'll talk up to that point right now. So when you started to get better at golf and you had to choose between hockey and golf at kind of 16, when you're making that decision, um, what was it about golf that you were like, OK, this, <laughs> this, is, this is what I want to do as my career? To be honest, it's because I was worse at it. I was a better hockey player than I was a golfer, and that irritated me. My competitive, my competitiveness and my ego was like, no, you've got to be good at the sports. And I'm glad I chose it as well. Like financially, it makes more sense. I'm traveling the world doing what I love at the age of 23, and people are like, how? I get this all the time. People from school who see me, and they're like, so what are you doing? Are you studying? So I said, no, I'm not studying. Are you working a job? I said, no, I'm just playing golf. And they're like, How? Like so many people just don't understand and I'm literally traveling the world while working, seeing new countries, meeting new people. It was the best decision I ever made. It was a very difficult one, kind of. Everything led towards golf and I sucked at it and my ego response was, well, I'm going to do this because I know I, I can try and master it. Stupid. Don't know how you think you can master golf, but anyways. Um, so yeah, that's how my decision was made. And luckily, I was at a point when I was 16 that it was only between golf and hockey because, as like I said, as I got older, it was harder to balance social life, passing school and sport when I had so many. So I slowly started to cut away as I got older. So I think once I, we, we don't work in standard, we work in grade. So once I got to high school, I had to cut away a sport. And then once I got to a grade higher, grade higher, grade higher, and then in matric, I said, cool, I'm only doing hockey and golf, and then we'll go from there. I got a few scholarship offers to go study in the U.S. I didn't really want to. I felt like it was the right thing to do, but it wasn't 
the right thing for me. I was going because it was the right thing to do and studying is good and it sets up your future, but I didn't know what I was going to study. Um, my grades weren't great, good enough to get into a school, but my golf was. So my school was limiting me on what school I could go to to study. I'd met my now husband then. I don't know, everything just said to me, why do you want to go all the way there when you could study back home or study on the side while you play because all I wanted to do was play. Like I said, <laughs> studying was no interest whatsoever, but it was something you need to do when you're making big decisions like that because, you know, everyone wants to be a sports star, everyone wants to be a professional golfer, but it's 1% that make it and it's hard when you do make it and when you're good, it doesn't mean you're good every single day and things like that. So, yeah, you also have to be realistic with yourself. So I did say, yeah, I would study. I actually made deals with my mom as we went along. So, yeah, that's how I ended up here. And luckily, I cut back sports as we got to that stage. But, yeah, hockey was – if I think about it now, I'm like, oh, I would never have done hockey. But it was a tough decision then because I had a great team. I had great friends in it. I really enjoyed it. Actually, hockey, for I think for the team aspect, for all of that, because – most of my dedication was to golf, and that's you by yourself doing your own thing, that kind of thing. So I really enjoyed the team aspect, and it made me work really well with people and be a lot more patient because I definitely wasn't when I started hockey. And that must be why that team aspect has continued so far. <laughs> <laughs> so who were some of the people that you kind of looked up to as you were getting better at golf? Um, I So many people, it sounds so terrible, I don't even know if I should say this, but people are like, wow, Annika Sorenstorm's here, and I'm like, I have no idea who that is. Just based off of not how famous she is and what she's done, but it was just not my era. Like I said, I played a lot of sports, so my whole focus wasn't golf. It wasn't watching Tiger Woods from the age of four and just falling in love with it and learning about new golfers. It was such a variety of things. So I just had like, you know, you have that one person that you always look up to. So I didn't play tennis. I played tennis when I was very young, but I didn't really play tennis, but I always looked up to Serena Williams and then, once I got into the Serena Williams fan club, then eventually start finding other people. So um, my biggest inspiration golf-wise, I think she's cooler than Tiger Woods is Suzanne Peterson, but I don't want you to tell her that or her to see that. But she, I think she's so cool. I just love the way she played golf. I always looked up to her in that way. And funny enough, she never got to world number one, but I, it was just my, my person. She's also really good at sports. She loves sports. She loves being active. It was everything I wanted to be she was so I looked up to her a lot I loved the way she played how passionate she was she used to swear on the golf course because she was so passionate about it and so many people like wow that's not respectful but it was I could see it was her passion and from one sportswoman to another you can see and you know when it's tending to be like a rude swear word or you really just have passion for it and yeah that was my person and that was who I looked up to and I read some of her books and I watched her movies and I watched her play all the time. I actually saw it sort of grander and I just walked the opposite direction. I was like, I can't deal with this right now. I'm just going to go the opposite direction. And then I can't remember who it was. I think it was Pacey. Pacey came to me and she was like, I can introduce her. I was like, absolutely not. Unless I get introduced somehow, not this way that it's like set up, I'm out. See you later. So yeah, Susan Peterson was definitely that person that one up there she was I like I said I think she's cooler than Tiger Woods in my opinion and then obviously um Pacey being South African seeing what she had done people always say Ash but I didn't know Ash because she was she wasn't at her top where she is now when I was young looking up she's at her top now well I know her but Pacey was winning LPGA events LET events winning LET order of merit when I was a youngster looking up so I'd say Pacey and Suzanne Peterson and it's it's a nice realization to see how far you've come in your career because now Pacey's one of my friends it's someone I played with uh, someone I beat a few times she's beat me a few times it's it's nice to think back that little kid that used to look up to her now she's one of my friends that I compete with and travel the world with. I was going to say the fact that you are so young yeah, I mean, you've managed to get on tour and you're able to play with other South Africans on tour who I'm sure you have looked up to <laughs> for the for the past you know five ten years is that something yeah. that it was one of those moments that you're like wow okay like a real kind of rain check kind of thing of yeah definitely you know obviously a lot more in the beginning I was like oh my gosh there's Leanne Pace now I'm like I'll phone her and say, what's up, Pacey? It's just a normal thing. You know, when you're young and you look up, you always think they're like superheroes, but they're just normal people that are nice and know how to do something really well. Uh, I also had that actually with Nobs. So, Nobuchle Dlamini, uh, she 
she was very much my era, but not, I wouldn't say necessarily someone I looked up to because I want to be there one day, like at the end of my career where Pacey and Suzanne was like, one day my maximum, like my peak point in my career, I want to be there. When Nobs I competed with as an amateur, um, mm -hmm. obviously I was much younger. I actually saw a picture. My mom sent me a picture the day, the day I met her. She had won an amateur adventure in South Africa because she killed it as an amateur. She won everything. And th I looked up to her in that sense. Um, so I, my mom sent me a picture. I think it was the first time I met her. I was about maybe 12 or 13. And she had just won a big, the, one of the biggest South African events as an amateur. And I remember I took a picture with her and I'm like, I looked at her, I was like, I used to look up to her and she was a bridesmaid at my wedding. Like, life is so crazy. She's like my best friend and I used to look up to her and I asked my mom if she can take a picture with me and it was with Lamini. So it's actually quite funny. <laughs> You're going to want that picture, I'm sure. Yeah, it's crazy to see how far you come in life and it's weird to see how life takes a different turn. You know what I mean? Like, yes, one day you dream of meeting these people and being like them, but you never actually think it's going to happen and then... Once it does, you're like, oh, okay, that's they super chilled. Like it's you didn't just meet Superman. It's just Leanne Pace, and she's just a normal person. She's really good at golf. She's achieved everything she has, but she's just a normal person. That's really nice to and has been in your shoes before. And if you do give us that photo, I'm sure people will be able to see it on social. <laughs> social. Nobs and I both <laughs> look at him and we're like, oh, we were so skinny. <laughs> <laughs> And you're yeah. talking then about your amateur career, obviously, as you said, you met her when playing amateur tournaments together. So what was that like when you were progressing kind of from junior to amateur and doing all the different competitions and traveling a bit more and, you know, really starting to see improvement in your game? I Like I said, I fell in love with the sport because of ego and I, I was like, man, I just, I'm not good at this, so I want to be good at it. And then the people you meet, like, yes, it is an individual sport, like, you know, everyone's on their same path, but... I've made so many friends on the LET and it kind of feels like a family and so was amateur golf. You know everyone, you know everyone's parents because they're all at the same events on the weekends. We all taking a drive out, going to play the same golf course, seeing the same people continuously. So amateur golf was really cool in that aspect and that's when I fell more in love with the game because like I say, golf or sport was a big social outlet for me. Um, so yeah, it was really nice. I loved the game that we could meet new people, meet their parents, compete with them. Afterwards, you can go and have a pizza and all that. So yeah, my amateur career is pretty boring. I was very average because I had so many other interests. Um, it only really got good when it was only hockey and golf. Um, before that, it was nothing special. We had a very competitive group uh, that were the sim a similar age. So like I said, when I started playing, like when I was playing with Kaylee Telf and that Nobs was much older. She was winning everything. She was about to go to college or whatever. So like I said, she was not before my time, but not in my group of who I really competed against. I was probably still in B division while she was winning A. So yeah, my amateur career is really boring. Um, only the last year did I really do anything good. Um, the last two years, I would say, that's when... It was just hockey and golf matric year and the year after matric. That's when um, my golf was more serious. I'd won, I hadn't won anything. I kept coming second. It was so frustrating. Oh, because the competitive person in me was like, are you joking? I think I came second five tournaments in a row. Just couldn't get over that winning line. Then you start thinking, is this for me? Maybe I should go study, you know, all those things. And then miraculous, miraculously, I actually won the biggest event as an S amateur that you can win. Uh, I was called S amateur stroke play or something. I won it on the last hole. Imagine making a putt on the last hole. Um, <laughs> so I won that. And then things obviously t turned around for me because it wasn't just any win. It was the biggest win. So... Yeah, I won that, and then I played a couple of events after that. I won them. I got to second in the country was the highest I got to. I wasn't really chasing that one because it's such a long span of years getting those points to get to that point. So I knew it was kind of like you're going to waste another year playing amateur golf just to get to that number one when you're right there. So I got to number two. I went to my mom, and I said, I'd like to turn pro, and her face was like, Ugh, as you can imagine. And I said, I want to turn pro. I'm going to play in South Africa. Um, I don't come top 10, I'll go and study at Tix, which is a university there in Pretoria in South Africa. She's like, okay, fair. Um, and I was like, yeah, now we have to work. Firstly, when you turn pro, my whole mindset changed when I turned pro. 
and I achieved my goals and I still haven't studied and mom's happy and everyone else is happy so we're doing okay so far. Of course and um, as you say you mentioned that decision of turning pro so what was it like in those early days when you made that decision you were like okay now nah, now it matters <laughs> not that it didn't matter before but it's a different yeah it was very different it was like a whole life turn for me um I had a very social life I had a lot of friends we used to go out partying and which was a normal I was a normal 18 year old but I got that so much out of the way that when I turned pro, pro when I was 19 um after my gap year and like I said I went to my mom and said I wanted to turn pro and she said cool uh on the sunshine ladies tour if you don't get top 10 then you're gonna have to study um I was like okay now we have to work I remember I came I think I finished third or fourth on the order merit so I was like sweet box ticked then after that, LET was a big decision for me. It wasn't just like, oh, okay, you've done well on the Sunshine Tour, go to LET. LET is competitive. There's not many South Africans on it. you got to really be good to be on the LET. And um, remember I said to her, I want to go to the LET Q school. So we had a golf day, raised some money to go, um, did everything we could, one chance, and that was it. And my mom said, go, and if you don't get your card, then come back and study and we can always go again later. We'll see how it goes from there. But let's tick this box and then you don't have to study. And if you don't tick that box. So I was like, cool. We went to LET, uh, LETQ school and I was like, you better get your card if you don't want to study. <laughs> I got my card first try. I got full card. And then life changed a lot from there. Then it became chaotic from not having, from having five tournaments as a pro my first year to having 30 something with Sunshine Tour and LET was a huge change. So yeah, that was very, very interesting. But yeah, turning pro was a, a good decision for me. I decided I, I wanted to do it. I Like I said, when I, I turned pro, I said, my whole life has to change now. Like I said, I was social, all that. And I remember I played, I went and practiced for a couple of hours and I came home and I was sitting with some of my friends at the table just chatting and Adrian phoned me and he's like, what are you doing? And I said, no, I'm just sitting chatting. And he said, I thought you were practicing. I said, yeah, I did go practice for a little while, and then I just came back. And he said, listen, these friends that you're hanging around, they're good people, but they're not going to get anywhere in their career because they're sitting chilling, and neither will you if you just sit and chill. If you want to be a pro and you want to be good, you have to sacrifice, you have to work hard, you have to do everything in your power to be as good as possible because all these girls want it bad, and if you want it bad enough, and you work hard enough, then you'll get it. So I got a little pep talk, like, you know, he's a bodybuilder, he's motivates himself, he works really hard, and he said those two words to me, and I said, okay, well, the next six months, I'm going to dedicate my life fully to the sport to get my, this was to get my card, so we play Sunshine Tour from January, February, March, April, that's when our events are, and then from there, Q School was in December, so I had six months, seven months to prepare, and that's when he gave me that pep talk. Because I've kind of felt like the bee's knees. I just played all right in the Sunshine Ladies Tour. My mom said I don't have to study. I've made a bit of money. Life's good. And he's like, no, no, this is just the start. So six months, I distanced myself from everyone. I kind of went into like hibernation and just worked and worked and worked. I didn't, I saw family a little. I saw friends a little, but nothing crazy. It would be like, oh, would you like to meet up for coffee and catch up? And then off I went. And I just went all out. I actually went like a bit overboard. I was a freak. I remember I used to wake up in the morning, cycle, do cardio for like an hour uh, at six o'clock in the morning, go and practice, go and play 18 holes, come back, go to deep tissue or do a recovery. And then afterwards train the night. And I did that for six months. I was like super ripped. I wish I had that dedication now or that time now. But I was super ripped. I was ready. My golf was getting in a good place. Mentally, I was in a good place because I'd really just hug it down. And I believe that's how I got my card. I really worked hard. And obviously, AD gave me the pep talk I needed to get where I wanted to. And that's kind of set up how I do things now. I work hard. I dedicate myself fully. I I wanted bad enough to sacrifice a lot to get it. So, yeah, that's just the way I am. It was the way I was. But... Also, it's very different when you're an amateur and you're pro. Like, the money for me wasn't really a thing. I feel like playing for money was just part of the process. If you play well, you get paid more. If you don't play well, you don't get paid. It's just I got paid. I didn't get paid anything as an amateur for doing well anyway. So it didn't really feel like a big difference to me. It was more the I had to change my surroundings and change what hard work was. Because now you're a pro. You're not into five is golf. You don't work an office job and you don't get paid a salary. You work hard you play well and that's how you get paid and yeah that's where my 
work ethic came from. I mean, I think it, it stemmed down from playing a lot of sport and that pep talk did, and he said the right things and yeah, here we are. <laughs> you Basically, the two things are you've always used being able to not study as a carrot and then Definitely. also uh, books from Adrian. <laughs> yeah, Literally. And in terms of Q School itself, what was that experience like? Because um, obviously, I mean, it's a tough week, tough time, isn't it? So, yeah, what was that like coming over and doing that anyway? I think it was really hard, but nothing I didn't expect. Like I said, I trained like an army sergeant for six, seven months. So everything that happened, I expected and I prepared for, which I think was really key. But also seven months of your life to do one thing and tick one box is a lot of time. You know what I mean? Like... And it wasn't just seven months of, oh, I'm going to practice here. It was like all the way through. So, yeah, Q school is hard. It's tough mentally, physically. Uh, I think it was physically the hardest three weeks of my life because I had never played an LET event. So I went from the beginning, beginning, beginning. Um, I did practice rounds, pre-Q, practice rounds for the final stage, played the full final stage. Uh, and I made it through all the way through. So I played all five rounds. I played practice round in between. I I was so tired after Q school because I literally prepared seven months for this event that when I got there, I was physically and mentally ready for it. But afterwards, I was drained from not just Q school, but the seven months of, months of preparation for it. It's a hard week. It is what it is. It's a long week physically you playing I think I played two practice rounds plus the four days so that's six rounds of golf then I played nine holes nine holes in the two days off in the middle and then I played five rounds in a row from there so I'm 11 12 rounds in a row I got there really early it was my first trip to Europe was Q school so I think I even got there early I, th- I remember working at Alton was something like 14 days of golf straight besides for the nine holes, nine holes in the middle. And I was training every single day at the gym that was there. So physically, it was just tough. Mentally, it was hard, and you've just got to stay cool because I think a lot of people, it's easy to say from the outside, and it's easy to make decisions from the outside when you're not in that space, but that's what makes a good sportsman or good sportswoman what they are is making decisions when things are hard. But it's just mentally a tough week because you know how much is on the line. You get no money at Q School. You spend all your money. You've just had a golf day in South Africa, used every last penny that you have to be at Q school. 20 girls get their cards. You got one shot, don't mess it up kind of thing. And if you think that way, you struggle. I I literally went there. I went to Q school and I was like, no one knows who the hell I am. I'm going to go there and introduce myself and say, this is Cassandra. And this is how I play golf. That was my mindset for it. It wasn't to leave with the card, even though that was the end goal. And I think that's what helped me a lot to get my my card and I was well prepared I knew what shot I could hit and how I could hit it because of all the preparation for it and I just stuck to my guns but it's a hard week eh? oh my goodness I met a lot of my friends there but it's a hard week and it's cold and oh I don't want to do that again (laughs) the goal is to never go back to school um and then what was it like adjusting to tour life 2020 was super boring for me. I remember I'd got my card. Everything was exciting. Everyone was like, wow, she got her card. She's going to go play in Europe. Um, And then obviously LET season starts in South Africa. I think it started in Australia then, but I didn't have money to go to Australia anyway. So it was so great. I had a card and no money and I was like, cool. Now what? Decided not to go to Australia. I played in South Africa. This was before COVID shut down. And we heard all these talks about COVID in the world, but we never got it uh, yet. We had no talks about it. We had no preparation for it, nothing. I remember playing SA Open was my first European tour event. I remember playing it. And after that, I was actually flying from Cape Town to Saudi because the Saudi event was supposed to happen there. That was the next event. And then from there, Europe would have started. So I had my flights booked for Saudi. And I remember the Monday... No, this, yeah, it was the Sunday afternoon when we had finished SA Open. Didn't have a great event, but I didn't expect anything. It was my first European tour event, but it was still a Sunshine Tour event, and it was just weird. So then the world went into lockdown. And then the LET still had events with a lot of strict protocols. I remember that. But South Africa is on the red list the whole year, so I could not get out. So you had an opportunity to get out. There was a week that you had the opportunity to get out. And if you got out, you stay out, you don't come back. And I remember I, all my stuff was booked for Saudi and then COVID happened. So I obviously had those bookings, but 
couldn't get the money back on it. So I didn't have the money to go. And I was like, I'm not going to risk going there, run out of money and then be stuck in a country and put myself in that situation. So I remember Lejean went and a couple other girls went. Um, I played nothing. I played S Open. That was it for the whole of the 2020 season, which was supposed to be my first year, uh, which was a bit of a bummer because, I mean, you look at the schedule and all the countries. Like I said, my first time in Europe was for Q School. Now we've got Italy, we got France, we got Spain, we got all these cool events and... Now I've got to sit back in South Africa and wait another year to go and travel. But I did. I waited. Um, then we played this event in Saudi. So I literally played two events in 2020 for my whole LET season. Obviously, started off pretty well with the uh, event in Saudi. Uh, we started there. No one really understood how the team thing worked. We we kind of understood it, but we didn't know how it would go. And I was the random pick for the Pedersen team. And we won it. And was pretty cool because I just missed the cut the week before for the individual because we still went for two weeks at that time and came home and that was my 2020 season 2021 started and it was I was like I don't know if I can do this if this is how we have to travel like it was so hard um I remember being a roomie with knobs and obviously she's traveled before but she hasn't traveled during COVID it was hard and you had to figure it all out and so I learned a lot from knobs on how to travel and how to be chilled and if things go wrong, ask questions and don't panic. Because, you know, I don't know, I feel like everyone when you're in an airport, you just feel like crying if things don't go right. And she was like, just chill. We go to the desk here and we ask. Nobs is like the most chilled person ever. And then you ask here and she does a little slow walk. So Nobs taught me how to travel in that sense. And 2021 played a few more events. Um, it was still hard, though, to get out. So I remember I was in South Africa and I could go to wherever the event was. It was in Spain or whatever because they accepted South Africans uh, not like on the red, like being on the red list, they still accepted you and whatever because I didn't want to quarantine or anything. Obviously, it cost a lot of money and it's annoying. So I remember I played a couple of events and then I went home. Like I said, it was my first year traveling. It was all new to me. It was quite hectic. So I went home after six weeks. Um, Nobs came with. Then we couldn't get back out because... You know, the rules kept changing every week. So one day we were on red list, one day we were on orange, and one day we were clear to go. And So I remember I had to <laughs> fly to Sweden, because Sweden accepted the red list countries, play an access tour event there, and then fly into Europe. And then once I got into Europe, I just stayed. So it was a tough year traveling. Uh, you're in the most beautiful countries that you've never been to, and you can't do anything besides see a hotel room and knobs the whole time. Uh, rent a car, the golf course, you could hardly see anyone because there was the players lounge were restricted and the whole bubble thing. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this, if this is how we travel, like this is hard and boring. And I feel like so isolated. I mean, and that was obviously the point, but I was like, this isn't for me. This is how it is. And then, yeah, 22, 22 happened. And I was like, this is freedom. I remember walking up to, I think we started in Spain and I just had a stack of papers and I was like, here's my test. They're like, just go. We don't need this. I was like, yes, now I can travel. Um, hubby also traveled with me. The, the my I feel like my first year after COVID, which was last year, it was so much fun. I had so much fun. We had so much fun. We traveled a lot. I enjoyed the golf. It was a lot of fun, but COVID was new. No, that was terrible. It was so expensive. For, I think the tour and the players because obviously the tour had to set up all these bubbles and make it work somehow and no, it was oh, it was horrible I won't do that again but I did it my rookie year boring you, yeah you managed to get through it <laughs> and then last yeah. year have your first ever year and I'm sure that will keep happening that you keep having keep getting better and better but yeah last year obviously with it being much more normal before the start of the season you also got you mentioned hobby. Obviously, you got married. How was that for you? It was super, super romantic. I kind of said, because we got engaged, and then he said, we actually got engaged. I don't even know. I've got to check the date. But anyways, it was a while before we got married because of the whole COVID thing. He's, I said, so we can get married this year now. COVID's passed. We can get going on this thing. And he was like, cool, so let's pick a date. And I was like, just give me three or four weeks, and then we can decide on a date. And he's like, okay. And like, the schedule's coming out find a spot that's where you're going and that's kind of what we did I low-key phoned the Sunshine Ladies tour and I was like can you just give me an idea of what the schedule is you don't have to tell me the dates you don't have to tell me the events just tell me an idea if I throw it in there what am I missing and they did and 
I missed the one Sunshine Ladies Tour event and we got married. It was great. It, I planned it in two months somehow. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of family there. It was in South Africa, obviously. And um, three days later, I left to Kenya for my first LEC event of 2022. So, yeah, shame. I left him just after we got married. But he knew what he got himself into. He knew who he married. So it's <laughs> one of those things. And yeah, and then we, we didn't do a honeymoon. He came with us, with me to Europe. We stayed in Europe for six months. Because his parents live in the UK, uh, so we used that as a base and we traveled around. We had so much fun. It was cooler than going to like Greece for a week or the Maldives for a week. We spent six months together traveling everywhere. He absolutely loved it. He went to countries he had never seen before, but I had with knobs in a hotel room. So I kind of knew how the country worked, but hadn't seen it myself either, like outside of the hotel room and the golf course. So we had the best year so much traveling and I think I got him hooked because he's here so <laughs> he's still going strong and all that so yeah we had a, like a lot of fun it was hard to plan and find a date but uh we kind of just took a leap of faith and we're like okay well if we miss it we must if we miss something we miss something but let's do it in the beginning of the year weather's great in South Africa firstly and at least he usually only starts later on because you don't really want to be overseas and then fly back to try plan your wedding in two days, get married, and then fly back out. Because, you know, we have chocolate block seasons. It's not just, oh, we play one event and here's five weeks off. It's chocolate block and you got to pick what day, what weeks you want to take off and things like that. So I found a spot. I planned it in two months and off we went. As I said, one of uh, the key things I learned about Adrian last year is he always finds the gym. If you need a gym near the hotel or near where the golf oh. course is, he'll have found it. And if you need a place to buy good chicken breast, ask him. Or rice. That's to do with gym and food. That's, yeah. that's your guy. He's the go to for that. Um, so, yeah, last year he had a couple of top 10 finishes in South Africa and then Italy. So, talk me through that in Jeddah when obviously um, you're part of Team Nicole Zahia. And that was just a little bit chaotic all around because we had playoffs in both the individual and the team. So, there was just a lot going on. Yeah, there was a lot going on. It was a really fun week. I remember Nicole and I spoke about it. Because um, people like, uh, once you've won a team event, obviously people like picking you. And you know how it goes. It goes in reverse order. She's like, I really want to pick you, but I never get the chance to pick you. I never get the chance to pick you. Paisley has also been saying that. Uh, she's like, Florida, are you playing Florida? Because I'm going to be one of the first picks that I'm going to pick you. Um, so anyway, so Nicole said, no, I want to pick you. I really hope I get the chance. And then I remember that they did the pick. And... She said, uh, I remember it got up to her and I was like, ah, she's going to pick me. But some people do say they're going to pick you and then they change their mind in the moment. It's just, it's what, it's whatever they want to do. They're the captain. So she picked me and then obviously she had a great week. Um, and then we got Teresa and Teresa was on my team. Jeepers, I've played so many of these, I've got to think. Oh, Bangkok, I think. Yeah, ba yeah I think it was Bangkok. Anyway, so she was on my team there and we got picked and I don't think Nicole knew who she was and I was like she was like oh it's fine it's we'll we'll play it. obviously if our third is our third is I said no no those girls are birdie machine and she's really nice and I don't know Nicole just has fun on the golf course she's just that type of person we had so much fun that week once again I didn't make many birdies came in clutch when needed to be but anyways Nicole actually made a joke on the last day we were playing because we played it in reverse so nine in Saudi was our 18 and she said if you don't make eagle here then you're playing the playoff because we needed an eagle to make the playoff no we need an eagle not to go into the playoff I remember I made part she's like yep you in the playoff and I was like I just three putted the last hole and now you want to trust me to be in the playoff like sure yeah sure so I thought she was joking I, was, I said she should play and she's like no ways you hit it over that bunker off you go and that's what I did I hit it all over the bunker I hit seven nine in terribly on the green and hit a two putt and made birdie and Christine hit a pretty good putt and just I think it lipped out or just missed and that was my game plan anyways that wasn't really a clutch putt it was like Christine can't carry the bunker she has to lay up so I'm just gonna hit driver and whatever I hit on the green and two putt until she misses a birdie putt because she has to up and down every single one. So that's my game plan, and it worked on the first hole, and I was like, done. That one's out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> we really had fun, and uh, Nicole had a great week individually as well, but it was just such a cool week. Her caddy, Doug, is the funniest guy. We had so much fun. He was making jokes. Teresa's boyfriend was canning for her. He was also making jokes. We just had, uh, like, a, just a 
really fun week. Like Nicole at the beginning of the week wasn't like, oh, I want to win this. She was like, well, you know how to win a round. She had this should be fun. And then we just had fun. That was it. I played terribly, came in clutch when I needed to be. And that was it. So I'm hoping for better like an individual, like I said. Mm-hmm. The team things I understand, but the individual would be really nice too. Yeah, for sure. And how have you seen kind of your game improve since you've been on tour, obviously playing in these different events at different courses all around the world? Obviously, as you've mentioned, your length is pretty important in terms of that playoff hole for it is, for example, 18, obviously the fact you could carry the bunker, but um, yeah, how much improvement have you seen in yourself? Yeah, a lot. I think having the right skills to do the right things at the right time is important, if that makes sense. You know, it's easy to hit a chip when you're playing with the boys on a Saturday. When you have to up and down to win a team event, obviously it's a whole different ball game. And I think that's what I found the biggest difference between amateur and pro. It isn't the money, it's the pressure, but it's so nice. Like, it's so much fun. There's nothing better than being in a pressure situation. So, yeah, I just, I love that aspect of it and... I think it will forever be what I strive for and what everyone strives for. I have a saying for me personally, not everyone, but I think it's harder to get into a pressure situation than it is to perform a pressure situation. Yeah, I just, it's that buzz. I mean, it feels like you're dying at the same time, but it's the best feeling in the world. I remember with Singapore, I was super nervous because, you know, when you have a long putt and you miss it, then everyone's like, oh, it's okay. When you have a short pass and you miss it, everyone's going to be like, come on, are you serious? So I remember I had a watch on and I checked my heart rate. And I was at like 147 while hitting a one meter downhill left to right of putts. And I was like, well, this is what we work our whole lives for. No matter how big or small the event, it's the, the feeling, the adrenaline rush you get. And you can't make the pressure up, if that makes sense. Like you can't, I think that's where you find champions are born and champions aren't like, because you can't train for your heart rate to be at 147, making a downhill left to right. So you know what I mean? Like, unless you run around the park and then try hit the putt. But what I mean is you can never recreate those nerves and practice for it. You can mentally prepare and physically prepare. But once it comes to that moment, it's the craziest thing. It's the best feeling ever, though. Like, I don't know how else to explain it, but like an adrenaline rush. It feels like you driving an F1 car and you're really just hitting a little white ball into a hole. But yes. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And in terms of this year, uh, 2023, how have you found it so far? Because obviously you started the year on the uh, Sunshine Ladies Tour, which you've mentioned, obviously winning over there and then coming and playing on the LET as well. So you've done a bit of both at the start of the year before this break. How how did you assess the first three months of the year? Yeah, um, it was a busy year. I always like playing the Sunshine Ladies Tour events. I think they're good confidence boosters because... They're slightly easier to win depending on who's playing kind of thing. Um, it's nice to support the home tour. It's nice to see the, the South African girls playing and a lot of them asking you questions and wanting to do what you want to do kind of thing. Um, I'm sure a lot of girls looking up to me like I did to knobs or whatever, that kind of a thing. Um, so, yeah, I love playing the Sunshine Ladies Tour events. Played well. I actually forgot it was won- I won this year. I thought it was last year. Anyways, um, good year. Good start to the year. Um, I remember I missed Kenya to play an event in Sun City. I just knew it was the golf course I really liked. Kenya was a long trip for me. Golf course didn't really suit my game, so I decided to stay back home and play that and then head off to Morocco and Saudi. So I've had a busy start to the year, but also a quiet one at the same time. So it was like all in one squished together sprint and then seven weeks of nothing. Um, so, yeah, it's been interesting. It's been okay starts, nothing Fancy, nothing wow yet, but um, we've got a busy schedule now. I've got an eight-week run, I think. No, six-week run now before I head back home. So this should be fun. And, yeah, I'm kind of just – this year's approach is a little different. I finished higher than I wanted to last year on the Order of Merit, which is good. Um, I think I set a goal for top 50, and I came 30th or something. Um, so I kind of set a goal this year to essentially play less but play better kind of thing obviously you have to see how that goes you can't just play less and play better if it was that easy that everyone would use that formula but so I didn't play Jabra this week um I just struggled with the hard green so I decided not to play I came to Miami early and I'm just taking it by run by run so I remember after SO Open decided what we're playing where we are on order of merit and that kind of thing um 
So yeah, after this run, we'll make a decision and see. But I'm going to try play as little as possible, as well as possible, and try get a top ten and maybe go to LPGA Q School. I'm thinking about it, looking at it. Um, I've never done it either. It's my first time in the states now. It's been crazy. The biggest cars you've ever seen and a big adjustment. So I'm just taking it as it comes, and hopefully I can go to Q School and see what it's all about. I was going to say you mentioned goals there, and I'm going to ask kind of how you set goals in golf. Like, do you have Goals for you, as you said, the order of merit or results, goals that you kind of want or? Yeah, I think uh, I go more on, uh, I wouldn't say I plan for each event, like I'd like a top 20 at this, but I think for a run, I'm at a skill level now where I can set a goal because even if I have an off week, I should still get to that goal kind of thing, if that makes sense. So like in the beginning of the year, I have a goal of where I want to be on order of merit. And then as each run goes, we adjust what we're going to play and our goals to where we at at that stage. So, yeah, um, like I say, I'm in top 10 order merit to try get into final stage Q school. Um, even if I don't get in, I'm, I might think about going. Um, I'll look at the whole process and then, yeah, just jump some places this week with the runs and then win. I need to win. That's all. That's an easy goal. Um, but you mentioned lots of adrenaline bits and pieces throughout this. So I know that you love outdoor activities, adventures. You described yourself previously, yourself and Adrian as petrol heads. <laughs> what do you like to do outside of golf and, you know, the fun that you can have when you're not on the golf course? Um, I mentioned earlier we bought mountain bikes. I love mountain biking. It's our new hobby. Um, nothing crazy. It's kind of more for. I enjoy those type of hobbies because it's fitness and fun at the same time like sitting on a bicycle in the gym for two hours is the most boring thing you could ever do in your life but doing it out on the track doing the same thing technically is a lot better so love that petrol heads we love cars so we got used to it. when i was home more often we used to go to a lot of car shows so they do like car runs in south africa where everyone was nice cars meet up at a place and then they all drive to another place and you sit there and have breakfast and everyone like looks at the cars and revs the cars and talks about the cars and all that so we used to do that a lot and then what else do we do anything fun we do a lot of putt putts all the time in the gym um <laughs> trying different gyms out and then we buy lots of sneakers which is a problem you know i've only been here for a week and i've bought four pairs of shoes like there's something wrong with me <laughs> I do know that you like to have a good shop <laughs> every so often. Because we don't get cool things in South Africa, shopping-wise. And then you come to a country like this and you're like, whoa, for everything. I did prepare for it. I only bought one pair of shoes with because I knew what was getting. <laughs> you, you expected it from yourself. I mean, you did do I'm... the same thing in Singapore where you were like, oh, my God, have you seen this in the shop? Have you seen this? <laughs> Yeah, uh, for any listeners, yeah, Cass said in Singapore, she was like, have you seen the jewellery and this and that? So, um, <laughs> you know, she likes a good shop when she's out I on love the tour. <laughs> Especially when it's not your money that you're shopping with, that's the <laughs> shop. At the um, Joburg Ladies Open, where obviously it was your home tournament being in your home city, I know that you had a little furry friend come with you as well. Oh, out, Maxi. Yeah, out and see you. Um, on the course what's it like having a dog a three-legged monster <laughs> Nobs is the worst she comes over to my house and she's like tripod I'm like his name's Max and he has three legs but his name's Max she's like no his name's tripod I'm like okay Nobs you can just rename my dog whatever you like that's really nice it's been nice to have him it's hard to leave as well because he's an old man um we have a doggy care it's we call it it's called lucky dogs it's a lady she owns this place does doggy washes and uh, they do boarding, but she fell in love with this dog. So now he sleeps on her bed when we're not there, which has really been nice for us because she can look after him when we're not there. And then when we come back, he can come back to us. So, yeah, he's there chilling with the lady, probably freezing because it's quite cold in Sherberg. But my husband's obsessed with this dog. He can't go anywhere without this dog. If he goes to the toilet, the dog follows him. If he goes on the couch, the dog has to be on the couch. If he's eating steak for dinner, the dog's eating steak for dinner. Like, he's obsessed. We can only go to restaurants that allow the dog at the restaurant. It's getting out of hand. It's definitely getting out of hand. <laughs> he loves him. It's actually my my first dog. Um, I got him when I was 11. We adopted him from the SPCA with four legs then. Now he only has three. But my first dog that lived with my mom, and then I took him back. 
when I got a place and now my husband's obsessed, like obsessed. Everything we do is for Max. How we do it is for Max. Crazy. <sighs> and you just mentioned food there. I know that when you first joined Tour, you said that if you weren't a professional golfer, you might be a professional chef instead. Is that still the case? Mm, I mean, I cook really well and sometimes think that's why he married me. But um, yeah, it was something I was looking at that wasn't sport-wise. Like I said, you have to be realistic with yourself when you're an athlete and know that only the 1% make it. So whether it was hockey or golf or whatever sport I would have chosen, you've also got to be realistic. And chef sounded cool because you don't have to study or learn paperwork. And I'm good at cooking, so... That's what I did. I make a good a good meal every now and then. I, I actually miss it when I travel because cooking in your own kitchen and cooking in not your own kitchen is two different things. It's terrible. And um, I don't know. I just find it's so different. I started traveling with my own spices now, so maybe that will change things up for me. Spice things up. We'll, we'll see how yeah. that goes. You'll have to give us any meals that you make with your, you know, portable spices. I'm with yeah. you. Yeah, legacy Springbok spice. That's what it's called. Very nice. And I know that. Very sad, it? <laughs> I know that when we were in Joburg, you hosted lots of the girls <laughs> around at your place. You had a braai. Yeah. What's it like being able to do that? Having that run in SA, and I know Ash did the same, and everyone normally does having people around their house and meet their family and cooking for them. How important is that kind of aspect of? having those events I really really loved it It was the first year I did it before we had so much going on that it never just I always said it would do it and it never happened I really really loved it I wish South African the South African swing had a little bit more budget um, so that we could do that for all the players so they could all experience it whether it be at a golf course or a function hall or anything like that I wish that would happen but we're working on it I'm hoping to get it done in the next few years and we can really give the food is such a big part of South African culture. You know, we have so many different cultures in South Africa, but the one thing we can all relate to is food. And um, I think it's a big part of who we are. And I wanted to share that with the ladies on the LET. I mean, it's like going to London and not having fish and chips when you come to South Africa and don't have a braai. It's just wrong. It's not supposed to happen. So... Oh, I'm trying to arrange that we have one through the tournament so the girls can be invited to it. But I had so much fun. Um, Benji's obsessed with South African wine. I lie. He's obsessed with wine in general. And the girls tried Biltong, and I obviously know where to get it, being a local and things like that. Like, I remember, I think it was Alice, she said, I tried Biltong, and it's not nice. And I was like, no, try this Biltong. And she was like, wow, this is amazing. Whatever I had was terrible. So I just wanted them to experience that and... We took them on a safari. They saw lions and they went nuts. And I made it as fun as possible. And there were only a few of us. So I'd like to make it bigger next year. Nicole used to do it. I think she did it with a lot of the girls where she would take them out on a safari and all that. So I wanted to get it done through the tour so that anyone that wants to do it gets the option. So maybe next year. You said you wanted to come on the safari with us, didn't oh, you? Yes, I did. There's I... the baby lion. Exactly. I did try Bill Tong, though. Holy gave me some, so. I had some and food. yeah approved. I like it approved it's good and <laughs> yes so yes I'm I'm down for that <laughs> um well final section of this has is a little quiz that we do at the end so it's just kind of based on the let and your let career so far it's not a b d e c that's my answers <laughs> it's not very many answers. questions um so we'll see how it goes do you know what your lowest round on the LET is? 68. 67? Damn it. I was going to guess that, but it sounded a bit low. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, it, I went on our system. You've had a lot of 68s, though, but 67 three times last year, all in 2022. So oh, nice. try and beat that this year. Try and get, yeah. get a little I actually had a good run this year. Um, what was it? I think I shot... What's nine under? 62 in the beginning of the year. And I was like, sweet, let's go. Do that on the early team. That would be nice. Yeah. Um, how many consecutive birdies have you made in one round on the early team? It was five. Oh, stats say four. Well, that was a guess. 
<laughs> um, it was at the South African Investec SA Women's Open in 2020. So your first LET really? event. Yeah. Holes seven nice. to hole seven to ten. This one I'm hoping you'll get. Where was your only hole in one on the LET? Deanberg. <laughs> <laughs> it only happened That's a few, a few months ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, round three, second hole. But yeah, I know that that was one of your days where you were like, what is going on? <laughs> you couldn't make short putts, but you were making holes in one and eagles. <laughs> yeah, literally. It was the craziest hole in one as well. I think it was my fourth or fifth one. And I haven't seen one of them go in. It's all been on like a slope or a dip. So I literally haven't seen myself get a hole in one once. People just started screaming. And I was like, I guess it's a no again. It was the first <laughs> time that I have not seen. So annoying. But I've done it. <laughs> this one will be, so at the time of recording, how many eagles have you made so far on the LET in 2023? Oh, I saw they posted this on, on in 2023. Mm -hmm. I think it's five. Yeah, five. I saw Correct. that because they posted it on the thing the other day. Yeah, we'll see how you go on for the rest of the season. And then final one in the Aramco Team Series events since their inception in 2020, which South Africans have been part of a winning team? Ooh. Myself, Nicole Garcia, Ash Bruja, Stacey. Correct. All four. Easy I knew easy. that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yourself in 2020 in Jeddah, 2022 in Jeddah, 2023 in Singapore, Nicole in London last year and Jeddah last mm. year, and then Ash and Stacey were on the same team in Soto Grande in 2021. Perfect, see? Wasn't that hard? What a terrible team to be on in the British Open champion, whatever show you do. <laughs> Cass, thank you very much for joining me today. No problem. Thank you for having me and thanks for the chat. That's okay. And good luck for the rest of the season. I'm sure we'll see you again. Yeah. Safe travel. See you next week. It's a competition clinching shot. How about that? The LET Golf Podcast, the official podcast of the Ladies European Tour.